Ayo, welcome everyone to Today in the Scene by Indie Arcade Wave. I'm Joe, I'm your host, and here on In the Scene, we dive into what's going on with indie arcade developers, arcade owners and operators, and just general news in the scene. Now, we're going to be jumping into some pretty cool arcade stuff this week. We've got James in Wisconsin, who just opened Vintage Vault Arcade, and he's got a pretty unique story as to how he went from just starting to collect these games to actually now having too many for his house to need to open an arcade and having more on the way. So we'll bring James in. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad we were able to talk. Um, your spot is pretty cool. I, I was semi-familiar. I've been following you on Instagram for a while now, but yeah. then I saw the news uh, article about you and then Brian Armitage, who Brian seems to know absolutely everybody, yeah, he commented does. about you opening and I was like, done i need to talk to this guy so yeah well thank um, you brian yeah he got the word out too it was awesome to see not only him but other arcade owners kind of reach out because of that um news coverage it was really cool it was an honor to hear from a lot of the people that i look up to that were reaching out to me to say hey you're doing the right thing so yeah awesome. and i mean you're you're a local guy local kind of i guess i'm in minneapolis so anybody <laughs> midwest to me is is local in the arcade scene yeah um, let's just jump right in. Just introduce yourself and then tell everybody what sparked your addiction slash hobby that caused you to start collecting arcade games. Okay, awesome. So, you know, what started the whole thing for me was I basically ended up um, getting an arcade machine from my friend Mike Poland. And he, at the time, just dropped it off at my house. And I played it for, you know, a couple hours, always topping up my own score. And then before I knew it, I'd have friends over and they would always play it. And at one point we were playing for three and a half hours and I was like, I really need more of these. So then I reached out and I got a Missile Command Cabaret, which was um, my first purchase was from a guy named um, Jeremy Fox from Prince Arcades, who he's out in Bolingbrook, Illinois. He's, a, he's got a wonderful um, arcade out there, so go check them out as well. But uh, he definitely was like somebody that I linked into and then bought more machines from and then I still continuously buy machines from. So it was like, that was my first initial start to it and then before i knew it i had you know i think it was like 15 in the lower level and then like a, i think it was like seven or eight in the upper level um and then before i knew it i was like taking out cupboards to try to like make space so i could like fit them in in a rental property that i was not owning so it was like kind of comical but um then i started continuously buying them to the point of where i had to store them and i kept storing them to the point of where I was like, okay, now things are starting to break when I pull them out. That's when I became slowly confident over the years to try to fix the games up myself. And then also through like uh, friends that I've met online via Facebook and like other places, um, it's, be it's been really a humbling experience because they've all been really seeing what I've been trying to do and I've been really passionate about it and they help me and vice versa. And it's all like, there is no I in the arcade industry, it's a we. Um, you, that's why you gotta like know the right people and also try to reach out to the right people because you know in the end it's all like one big family so I'm really happy that it got to this point but at one point it got the bubble started to burst I was like what else can I do to end up maybe making money to keep growing the you know I, sh I should say arcade buying addiction so um, that's when I started to do coin up stuff and you know i linked up with io arcade bar in um madison wisconsin for about two years and then after that um they did all the uh bar stuff and i did some of the games and we just split split the revenue on that but i found out it was great um income that was coming in passively but it wasn't enough to really it just kind of paid my bills so it was like it was nice but at the same time you know I wanted something more and then after my contract was out it was like hey you got to go do something of your own because it got to a point where like we don't need you no more so that taught me you know maybe just start your own thing um and since then i kind of started the uh, vintage vault arcade in mcguanago and uh that was a move that was totally different than what uh, it was originally planned um i was originally in madison for the longest time and when i wanted it open I wasn't confident enough. I didn't feel like I had enough machines. Um, so I kind of waited it out and I lived month to month trying to buy machines slowly but surely. And uh, it got to a point where once I was confident to open, I would have from going from like the third or fourth arcade to like the sixth or seventh or eighth. So I was like, it's not viable though. It's very saturated in the town. And although I love all the arcades out there and I visit them frequently, um, I just thought it was like not a good business move to be like the dead last one. So 
that's when I was, um, uh, I'm still dating my fiance. Her name's Skylar, and she helps me out every once in a while um, at the arcade. Um, she's just been a really supportive person and just an awesome person to date. And what had happened out of that is I was going back and forth to see her every weekend. And we went to McGuanago, which is the town next to where she lives. And I could just see that there was tons of kids and there was nothing to do. There was only like a bowling alley. So I was like, let's start to look if there's anything open. And uh, she told me to call this number. And it was just some random number she saw from like, uh, I'm not exactly sure where she saw it. But it ended up being a guy named Ray. And uh, Ray Gooden from um, uh, Anderson uh, um, Commercial Group, he was the one that kind of worked really hard to find the right location for us because he saw that this was a huge thing for the community and he wanted to be a part of it. So long story short, the first building didn't really work out. The second building wasn't really, it had a weird time time frame. I couldn't get into it for like nine months. So uh, he's like, I know something that isn't available that I know the owner of the building and uh, I'm going to go talk to him. So when I saw it, I was like, this is the space. It's right on the lake. Um, it's I believe Phantom Lake, so it's really beautiful. The sun sets right there every day. Um, and when the sun sets, we turn the lights down and we dim the lights, so it gives a really cool vibe to it. Um, but it's like one of those things that it just felt right. Even though it was smaller than I wanted, it felt right, especially being in a town of only 8,800 people, which is constantly growing. It's probably more than that, but that was the last uh, census. So it was one of those conflicting things like should I do it coming from a really big city to like a smaller town um, and it ended up just working out and I'm really blessed to say that we've put a foothold in this area pretty well um, and we've only got more machines in this so we want to expand um, but we'll see what the future holds we're here for at least a couple of years yeah that's that's really smart that you you noticed that there were so many games in in Madison and and Mitchell's awesome uh, we've got a galactic battleground over in oh yeah uh, Ohio. And he's he's been really cool the whole time that I've known him. So it's, it's smart that you you saw that opportunity of someone that could kind of mentor you in the area, but moving away from the area that has so many arcades. Because I can I can think of five personally that I know in Madison. Yeah. Um. So just being another of those is 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 kind of a lot. But picking a town that only has a bowling alley, brilliant. So good good move on that. Yeah. Um. What like. I'm, I'm just trying to put this together for people that are interested in opening an arcade themselves. I hear a lot of people talking about, like, how do I acquire games, stuff like that. So what were you doing beforehand that made it possible for you to purchase all these games and start collecting? So, yeah, that's a good question. I had a lot of odd jobs, and the one that really stuck was the DJing. I, um, from about 2009 to 2013, had a very successful uh, career doing... Um, a lot of opening direct support gigs, which would mean you open right before the um, major act and all the top 25 DJs in the world at the time I did uh, openings for. I even opened up for like Kesha, um, Steve Aoki, Paul Oakenfold, ATB, um, Infected Mushroom, um, just tons of names. Like I, it's actually been kind of a blur. And uh, I actually helped bring even Skrillex to um, the rave one year uh, for their Stellar Spark New Year's Eve. So, and that was really cool because at the time he was like the hottest DJ um, and still kind of is when, once he came back. So it was really interesting to kind of take what I learned from that, um, promoting myself as a DJ, um, standing outside, handing flyers to people and like just going out and getting your own promotional pictures done and doing all the work yourself. It really was like a direct transfer over to uh, promoting the arcade. And when it came to actually getting the games, it was, just going to the arcades, finding out what I liked and what I didn't like, trying to go on a buying spree by trying the games, and then feeling out like what you need and what you what the customers think you're gonna want to see. And um, so it was kind of a blend of good '80s and '90s stuff. And how I found it was always going through like Facebook ads and Craigslist was big at the time, which just kind of dried up. And then once the one ups came out, it was really it was really hard to find actual dedicated cabinets and everybody got confused because they thought they had a real dedicated cabinet, but it's like, you know, one up from Walmart, which is great because it brings out, you know, um, awareness to arcades that are out there. But at the same time, it's like that flooded the market on Craigslist. So it got to a point where it was really hard to find original cabinets. Um, and now it's kind of like I've opened up to a lot of collectors that I bought one or two games from and they're like, hey, we're getting into pins or we don't want this game no more. No one's playing it. We don't want to store it. We know you probably want it. And then I end up looking at it. And if it's something that is just some some semi-unique thing about it, I love it. I'm going to buy it. Um, it's just 
well rounds out the arcade and um the djing really did help because there was nights that i made a lot of money and i mean like there was nights i lost some money but there was nights where i got a lot of money and i saved most of that before um i ended that career and then started focusing on heavily like doing the arcade so it was really it was a fun experience and it taught me a lot which benefited me down the road but um another thing is, is the machines weren't as expensive as they are now but they still were going up at the time. So I remember at the time, some of the machines I was paying top dollar, but now they're worth like twice as much because you know it's been five, seven years. Um, so that's kind of how I started getting the games and how I got the money for it. Um, and then, you know, it was all or bust. Once I opened the arcade, if it didn't work out, I could have lost everything. So it was kind of a risky situation, but I opened the door and I saw the jump and I took the jump and here we are today. Yeah, that's that's a really unique and interesting way to get into the scene. And I mean, you named off some big artists there. I've, Infected Mushrooms is like one of the best shows that I've ever seen. Oh yeah, um, great, great set. But I think, I think that's a really, really cool way to get into the arcade. And like you said, it's a big leap. It's a big risk to take. Um, yeah. There, I mean, there are a lot of people commenting on the videos that are that are saying, "I'm looking to open an arcade. I'm, I'm curious as to what this is, what earns stuff like that." Let's talk about what the biggest challenge has been for you. Like through this entire journey, what has been the most difficult part of opening the arcade for you um, at this point? I think that's a fairly easy question. All the failures, because every single time I failed, I felt like for the first few failures that it was like a stopping point. But then I realized that you only fail if you sit down and don't get back up. Um, and through every failure, I learned something. And through learning that next lesson, I applied it to the next step. So once I got ready to actually open a Maguanago, which I felt was a really good space for it, it was like I had a, a really sharpened sword. I felt like I knew exactly what to expect, how to counteract certain things that were gonna come at me um, with just the town, the rentals property, uh, stuff like that. So um, all the failures and, and also all the people that doubted it. There was a lot of people that would always doubt my capability or they thought that the idea was not gonna work um, they didn't see what I saw, and they didn't have my vision, so I just kept my head down quietly. Um, there was another challenge of having, you know, a certain time frame. You know, it took so long for me to do, like, just to stay super connected to something for almost six and a half years. It's really hard when you don't even have it going yet. It's like, is it ever going to happen? So um, by the time I was ready to open, I took the jump. It felt right because all the it, it was like at least 15 failures and not like opening up and just it failed it was just like the building didn't work out or the codes didn't match with the building that i was looking for or the landlord didn't uh there was some sort of stipulation on the building it just never worked out um, and and when i found this place it ended up being in just a perfect town um perfect neighborhood in a very nice building with amazing um landlords they're just great people um and they got an awesome business above me so it just like works out really well. And, and to be honest, it's right on the lake. It's, it's like a no brainer. So I took a smaller space, but you know, I always do want to expand in the future. I do have more games to throw down into a space, but um, for right now it's working. And if it's not broken, why fix it? So um, that's kind of like where that goes for, for now, at least until the future, um, you'll know then. Yeah, I mean, I it, it sounds like it just worked out. You know, I mean, all those failures led you to where you are. And if you mm -hmm. had jumped into any one of those, it could have gone a different direction. So oh, yeah. having that patience, taking the time, really finding the perfect scenario, even if it's a little smaller than you wanted, um, it works out very well in the end because, like you said, you can always go to a bigger space in the future. Yes. Um, you're, yes. you're setting your foothold there, and people are going to know who you are. Obviously, you're connected if you know, you know, Brian, you know, Jeremy. You probably know Doc Mac as well. I of mean, course, that, shout out Doc and Dose. They're great that, people. It's just a Midwest thing. So, like, you have all these people that have these massive collections, constantly have games being thrown in their face. Like, do you want this? Do you want this? Mm -hmm. What games are you still looking for? Like, you've got a good collection, but I'm sure there's plenty more. I mean, Doc's got like 900 on the floor. So, yeah. I'm sure he's selling them here and there. I like weird, rare uh, prototypes, stuff like that. Like, I'm always looking for, like, if it's unique because we like the whole museum um, aspect of what we're doing here. Um, I, I really appreciate, like, weird games and, like, hard-to-find games. It's almost, like, really fun when you find something that you know is very unique and you're... Like, there was one time when I found my Wacko. I got it for really cheap, and I didn't know what it was, but I just bought it just because it looked unique. 
Um, and then come to find out it's worth a lot of money and I got a really good deal on it. So it was like, you know, there's certain things I'm like, man, that cabinet just looks cool. It could be the artwork. It could be the gameplay. It could be just the feel I get from the cabinet. Um, uh, you know, there's some things that I buy that are have been in conversion cabinets that I want to deconvert at some point. Um, but you just run the games as, as they are. But most of our games are dedicated uh, originals from the factory. And, um, you know, I like to find dedicated, unique, rare stuff. That's like my fun thing. I like to have things on the floor that you're never going to see anywhere else. But if you do, it's going to be somewhere like Doc Mac, you know, at the Galloping Ghost, which uh, he's been nothing but great help all the way along the way. Um, I've known him for a very long time. I've watched him grow. He's watched me grow. It's just been such a good thing to have that kind of uh, help back and forth between each other. Um, and I plan on going back there soon to visit him. So he's a good guy. Is there, is, do you have like a list or anything of games that you are currently looking for? You know, not necessarily. It, it's kind of funny because I'll see it and then I want it. It's one of those situations. Um, there are some people that are like, hey, do you want this? And I'm like, I never really thought I'd buy one of those. I'm like, ah, sure, why not? So um, it's becoming a little easier because people are coming to me now. Um, but at the same time, you know, you only have so much finite money before you can just blow it all. So, um, you know, I do want Blaster from Williams. Um, I had a turkey shoot at one point. I don't want that game just because it, if I'm going to spend that kind of money, it would be something that's not going to break on the floor. And that game's kind of finicky and it'll break a lot. Um, especially with the optic board it's just very finicky um but i would like one of those i would love a splat which is another williams game super hard to find and an actual dedicated mystic marathon we have one here but um it's in a stargate cabinet which is a um the one that you should have the kit in which they did make about 400 i believe kits if, uh, correct me if i'm wrong but um i believe it's 400 kits and they were supposed to go on a stargate so um, it actually has a custom artwork on it too, but I would love it dedicated. And I know there's only a handful out there. So some of those hard to find Williams games I really want. Um, I kind of want some more driving and shooting games, which we are going to add some more of those soon. Um, our arcade's pretty full, but um, I say our like it's a it's a collective of people. It's me, but <laughs> um, we I should, I should say I I basically uh, I try to fill them as much as possible. And it, as soon as you think it's full, you can find a way to rotate the games to make a little bit more space to cram another game in there without taking away from the overall um, walking way, you know, without making it too crowded, which at some point it will happen. Um, but that's why I want to expand. You know, I do like the fact that we're really clean and uh, we've got a really good walk and walking area for people. So when it does get busy, it doesn't feel overcrowded because there's tons of ways to like enjoy the games here. But um more driving games, shooting games, rare Williams, stuff like that. That's kind of what I'm looking for. Um, but also anything the nineties, I'm kind of looking for more nineties stuff too. Yeah. I think that's, that's interesting that you brought up blaster. Cause I know I saw that on one of doc Mac's videos that he has the, the wood cabinet, which is rarer than the, Super like, rare. the, the other, the, what is the more pla like plastic version of it. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was at uh, Brian Armitage's arcade Starcade. him, Paul, and another person run that arcade and uh i saw a blaster and i was like this cabinet looks weird so i played it just because i wanted to and then i found oh, out cool. a couple weeks later it was super rare and i was like yeah i'm glad i got to experience that just because it looked weird is why i played it um it stands out so i guess that's that's kind of leads into the next question that i had is what do you think about the indie arcade scene like do you have any plans on buying any of these games and what games in the scene are you familiar with so i'm familiar with um a lot of the games that are currently out of uh researched them all i play a couple of them at certain locations that they're at and um i was really i really like switch and shoot so i'm going to buy one of those and hopefully i'm going to do that soon um from dsm arcade uh those guys are really cool and um i've loved the game i love the cabinet i like how the artwork is like retro but it's new and that's kind of what i like about it and so simple that it's just one uh, one button um i think that might get beat on a little bit with some of the kids but at the same time um i don't know how to expect that game to be perceived other than I do like it, and I think it would be a good addition. Um, uh, we do have a Cosmotrons here, and I, I like the Cosmotrons. I actually have a wood grain cabinet, or the woody cabinet is what they call it, and um, they thought it was the first one off the line, but it was number five serial number, I believe. Um, and it's really interesting, too, because that game has been around for some time. I had that at I.O. for a while, um, and then that rested for a little bit. 
before it came here and now it's here on the floor for people to play which people love it it's it really drives home in a four player scenario um so if you've got a bunch of your friends here you want to play some strangers it's such a cool game um there are games i'm more familiar with as well but there are some things i have my sights on in the future that i'm trying to figure out which ones to add at the right time i do uh like some of the other games but the prices are a little high and some of them but at the same time you know it's just because i'm in a free play scenario i'm not making as much money doing like coin up paying it off itself um but that doesn't mean i won't buy it at some point so there's there's certain games that i've got my eye on and i do know about most of them i love the fact that they're being created i think it's such a cool unique thing that there are still people out there trying to run newer games on newer platforms with new software and hardware to try to emulate that 80s 90s feel out of an arcade machine so i think it's really cool um and even with like the cosmotrons one of the guys that uh helped make it um dave fur is his name he actually lives in mcguanago so when we had an issue i had one of the it just wasn't starting up anymore um, he came through and fixed it within 10 minutes and it was one of those things that i learned a lot from him just by watching him and he told me exactly what went wrong and uh, it was fairly simple, but it was cool to have not only the um, owner come, or the I should say the guy that created it come help me out with, with it, but the fact that I can get one of his games to be directly, uh, how should I say this, put into the arcade that is in the town he lives in, it's it feels really good. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that that's a really, really cool side of the indie space is like you look at all these old games and you can find ways to fix them. You're getting old parts. Uh, you hope they work. You hope they don't go bad later. But the indie stuff is all new. And when you call customer service for one of these games, you get the guy that created it. Like yeah. Shane and Dave are awesome. I love Cosmotrons. I just saw Shane a couple weeks ago in Milwaukee when I went for Midwest yep, Gaming Shane's Classics. a good guy too. And I, I was playing. I was playing with him as well. Him actually, uh, Shane's. He, I got my Lunar Lander and my Warlords from him. And I think one other one. I I might be forgetting, but they're great people. I I love both of them. I go to Dave's parties every year. And now that I'm opening this arcade, it's kind of hard to be there because I'm like always oh, here now. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah, but they're great people. It's it's good to be connected like that with the people that have made the games. It's awesome, and that's why another reason why I love the indie indie wave. It's definitely like a good way to connect with uh, some of those platforms and some of those people. Like you said, you know a lot of the people, and you've had a lot of them on this show. So it's good to connect, and they can see what we're doing, what we what they're doing, and hopefully intertangle in between at some point. Exactly. That's always the goal. It's just, it's community. Community yep. drives all this. And that's, that's why everybody in the space is so easy going and easy to talk to. Yeah. Um, I, I really appreciate you coming on here, James, just shout out your social media so that people can check out what you're doing, where they follow you, things like that. And then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so if you go on Facebook, it's just facebook.com slash or forward slash vintage vault arcade and then, um, vintage vault arcade on Instagram. We do have a TikTok as well. Um, I would say our Facebook is the most responsive. That's the best way to get any information from us. Best way to see video games that hit the floor or repairs that um, are done. And um, if you want a birthday party or if you want to know anything about the arcade, that's the fastest way to get to me. Uh, we do have a phone number, but I do not pick up the phone unless I'm here. Um, so we respond to the messages throughout the week, but then we know we can miss the mark there a little bit for like, a, oh, we wanted to come in and we wanted to figure something out, but no, you didn't pick up, so sorry. But um, that hasn't really happened yet, but it's most people around this area already use Facebook. So I would definitely use Facebook out of all of them. But if you want to follow uh, the, those main three ones, those are the ones that I use. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on, James. Appreciate oh, you coming on. Yeah, uh, you're uh, welcome. And thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course. I'm excited uh, for your arcade for the future. And I, I want to try and make a trip out there. It, I know it's pretty close to Milwaukee, right? Yeah, it's about 25, 30 minutes away from the south side of Milwaukee. Like, when I go to go get food, it's about 25 minutes. But some people live about 35 minutes away. It depends on where you are in Milwaukee. But it's uh, pretty easy to get there. It's right off the highway. Um, it's like one light and you're there. So it's it's really unique, too, because it's in a nice community. Perfect. Well, I'm going to throw all the links down in the description to go check out James's Arcade, Vintage Vault Arcade. Uh, if you're in the area, definitely go check them out. And if you're still watching, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It helps us a ton. The wave will continue to grow, and we will ride it all together. And until next time, peace. Thank you.